body or in spirit for our responsive call to worship. With the world, church worldwide and throughout the ages, we proclaim Christ is risen, he is risen indeed, alleluia. With Christians near and far, past and present, we unite in saying, light is stronger than darkness. In the face of our suffering and the suffering world, we strive each day to hear the words of Jesus. Do not be afraid. Let not your hearts be troubled. Wipe away your tears. In the shadow of the cross, the crosses of injustice and oppression, we believe with Easter hope, death is not the final word. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. And please pray with me. O oh God, you punctuate our living with joy. Though we may be too busy too many days, Though we suffer in body, mind, and spirit under the weight of conscience and memory and ailment. Though we experience trauma and injustice. Though we see violence and evil in the world around us. Though sin is woven into our very nature and most days we cannot overcome it through sheer willpower. Nevertheless, at every turn around each corner we are surprised by joy, the joy of a child hugging our legs, the joy of music, the joy of a baby's giggle, the joy of a new day as light filters into the darkness, the joy of springtime colors and growth, the joy of community working and playing together, the joy of a momentary connection with your being, the joy of experiencing grace. The joy of being forgiven, the joy of reconciliation, today the joy of the promise of life both in our living and at our dying. Come, Holy One, into this moment of joy as we celebrate resurrection, a mystery, a promise, an experience, and a way of life. Hallelujah and Amen. I now invite our children to the back to meet Alana to carry forward candles to our cairn and stay, stay standing as we sing all of us together, Christ the Lord is risen today.
please be seated. Good morning. It is so good to see all of your faces this morning. Welcome to everyone, everyone that's here in person as well as everyone that is here on Zoom. Also want to welcome anyone who is a guest or a visitor with us. So just welcome uh, to everyone on this Easter Sunday. Welcome to Cairn. We are an open and affirming congregation of the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, and we welcome all people into our worship and our community. Let us prepare our hearts, our spirits, and our minds for a time of prayer by singing together. Uh, I have it in Latin as crucem tuum, but it is, O Lord, your cross. Please join me in praying our disciples' prayer. Great current of life and love within us, our source and sustainer, you fill our souls and our bodies with warmth and vibrancy, our universe with incomprehensible power and beauty beyond all our imagination. We are in awe of the immense force for loving and healing which your energy provides. We ask that your living, loving power permeate all our existence and rule in our attempts to tap your creative power to bring justice, mercy, and the energy and vigor of love to our existence on earth and throughout the universe. Provide us each day with the fuel we require to fulfill these tasks. Move us away from our tendencies to use the life and love you provide for much less than their potential and for much more than our own needs. Give us strength to use your love, life, and energy to understand those who seem not to care and who hurt ourselves and others with their lack of vision. For we long to know your life, your love, and your great force, continuing always in this beloved life and habitat which we all share. Amen.
and let us pray together. God of hope, the warm air and sunshine is healing to our bodies and our souls. The sight of living things sprouting from the soil is renewing to our minds and spirits. Each spring is just like the last, and yet our bodies move to this rhythm of the changing of seasons, and we cannot help but be swayed and rocked and moved by what might seem like old news. That the earth is renewed, that life grows, that hope springs in each delicate flower. We gather with gratitude for this time of year. At the beginning of this resurrection season, we sing our alleluias. We bring before you our joy and gratitude for the creative surging of life that is here among us. For our young people in all their hope and possibility. For our elderly in their wisdom and compassion. For our ministries that seek to reach out in hope to places of despair. For our history together and the love between us. For family ties for generous spirits and open minds, we give you thanks. On this day of recreation, we pray for healing, knowing this comes in many forms. The healing of bodies in the hands of doctors and nurses, and sometimes for reasons we cannot understand. The healing of minds and spirits in the care of communities, families, therapists, friends, and the magnificence and beauty of creation. The healing of grief or a broken heart by the gift of time and new life. The healing of relationships, both personal and political, through perseverance, forgiveness, confession, and reconciliation. We also pause to lift up in prayer those places where death is real in our world and your word of life is needed in bread and comfort and peace. We lift up our own nation so torn and divided by money, politics, and religion. We lift up the hungry, we lift up refugees and the homeless, we lift up slaves, child laborers, the abused the excluded and discriminated against for race, gender, sexual orientation, or countless other reasons we devise to dehumanize our neighbors. God of the old, God of the new, God of our past and our future, God beyond names, God of holy names and earthy names, God of creation and incarnation, God of cycles and seasons, springtime and new life today, we would partner with you in your ongoing renewal of creation. Weave your way among us, springing up new life in our hearts and families and our community of faith, that we might be a presence for life in this world. Recreate us, we pray, in the holy name of our brother Jesus. Amen.
In the season of Lent, we had several of us that spoke on the different theologies that had developed in the 20th century. We did Bonhoeffer, the Jesus Seminar, Feminist Theology. We did Process Theology, Liberation Theology. And I know I think I'm forgetting. Queer Theology. We covered a lot in our Lenten season. In this season, we're inviting folks to share their own experience of their image of Jesus. Who has Jesus been for them and how has that changed over the years? So I am the guinea pig today and I am sharing and I told Tom that I felt like I was writing an essay when I set out to do this and then realized that is really not what you wanted to hear this morning. So I'm just going to tell you a little story and what I learned from that because I've obviously, maybe not obviously, had a relationship with God and with Jesus since I was a very young child. God was pretty much more central for me than Jesus for many, many years, but you probably know how important Jesus is in my understanding of the world right now. So in 1979, I was 12 years old, and my family moved to London, England, as you know, and we lived in a great big vicarage next to a very grand church. And every Sunday morning, we went to the very grand Anglican church, and we worshipped there we, before we would have our much quieter, simple uh, community worship in the community in which we lived. This church was called All Hallows, and I loved it. I loved everything about the liturgy. I'd grown up Church of Christ, and they believed they didn't have a liturgy. There were no organs or pianos or guitars or any other kind of instruments. It was just singing, which was beautiful, but it was just singing and a preacher. And that was pretty much it. The Anglican Church had smells and bells, as we like to say. It had grandeur. It had images much more like this one that we have here today. Jesus the King. I loved it. I couldn't wait to go to church on Sunday mornings. Then there was this one Sunday where I actually paid attention to the words instead of just the aesthetic. I was 12. It's the prayer of humble access. We do not presume to come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Prayer of humble access. We are not worthy. I read and reread the words, and I sat there absolutely appalled. I felt degraded. I felt deceived. This did not sound like God. This did not sound like Jesus. This did not sound like me. I wrestled with guilt over such a proud and pious attitude, yet I knew there was something amiss in my beloved liturgy. A few years later, during my first year of theological studies at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, I got into a heated debate about human nature with a friend, and he said, no one is good but God alone quoting scripture, and these words, especially in the way that they were sort of brandished as a weapon, seemed false, ludicrous, and hateful. The goodness of God could not be separated from or conceived of apart from creation. Me, could it? These experiences for me, I think, led me to two significant understandings of Jesus that have lasted through all of my education. One 
is that Jesus questioned everything about his tradition that he loved and adored. He questioned everything. I am led to question, no matter who or what it is, and formulate my thoughts within a shaping community. I follow Jesus on that path. The second is that I don't think Jesus ever wanted the focus to be on him. All of our liturgies focus in music and word on Jesus. I think Jesus wanted us to focus on the people Jesus focused on. The marginalized, the poor, those left out. Those are the two things I learned from that early questioning of the Bible and my faith tradition. And I'm grateful for those experiences and all that I have learned in the churches I have worshiped with and served. And we're asking people to choose a hymn that follows their reflection on Jesus. I didn't choose this one, Mimi actually did. It's one I think we've done before, I can't remember, maybe not. But it's a beautiful song by the Waylon Jennies, and so we share it today. From the prophet Isaiah, chapter 65. For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth, 
The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it or the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days or an old person who does not live out a lifetime. For one who dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth and one who falls short of a hundred will be considered accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be offspring blessed by the Lord and their descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, but the serpent, its food shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. I'm going to do a reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in. And he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And then Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabunai, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that she had said these things to her, excuse me, that he had said these things to her.
The week before Holy Week, many of us gathered to brainstorm about our sabbatical in 2023. We shared with each other what makes our hearts sing. One of the people that shared told of a love of storytelling. This person is a gamer, so it narrows the field a little bit, who loves both video games and role-playing games, and they love to see a story told well and to participate in that story's unfolding or to create a world in which a story can unfold. I imagine all of us can think of a moment when a story told well has caused our heart to sing. Maybe it was a book, a movie, a TV show, a game, a sermon. It happens occasionally. A TED Talk. Or indeed, indeed perhaps best of all, a story spun by a parent or a grandparent or a friend over coffee or around a dinner table, a story that is crafted with characters and a plot to crescendo to the high point of amazement or laughter or tears. There is a reason Harry Potter, Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, the Marvel Universe, and Dune are so popular. There's a reason Hamilton has been such an astounding hit. There's a reason Ray Bradbury, George Orwell, Neil Gaiman, Terry Pratchett, Ursula Le Guin, C.S. Lewis, and Margaret Atwood have such a following. There's a reason Shakespeare is still the best-selling fiction of all time. There's a reason Agatha Christie is a close second. And there's a reason Danielle Steele is a close third. There's a reason Don Quixote by Miguel de Cervantes is the best-selling fiction book of all time. With A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens close behind. There is a reason the Bible is the best-selling book of all time. Storytelling. Yes, storytelling. As Franz Kafka said, the purpose of a story is to be an axe that breaks up the ice within us. The world's tedium and the world's threats can freeze us emotionally, physically, spiritually, causing us to hide or retreat or passively accept the status quo. A story can break the ice with an epiphany or melt it with warmth or dissolve it with laughter, or sometimes just help us escape the chill for a few blissful moments. Now, since that sabbatical meeting where this unnamed gamer helped me see storytelling again, I just feel like I've seen everything through the lens of storytelling. Or perhaps I should say that I've just, I've noticed how much of our lives is storytelling. This whole spring season is about how the church has told the story of Jesus, told it differently in each successive generation, told by Paul and the gospel writers as they sought to answer the question. Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? Paul's story of a resurrected son of God come to be the savior of the whole world, a sacrifice for the atonement of our sins. Mark's story of a Messiah that no one could understand because their preconceived ideas always got in the way. 
Matthew's story of a fulfillment of the Torah, the new Moses, the son of Abraham, son of David, a fulfillment of the prophetic story of a Messiah who would bring about that vision Mimi read today. Luke's story of a brand new era in which the church was a church of the poor and the marginalized, and they would rise up in the wake of the resurrection. John's story of a divine, prescient being with God in the beginning. And from those five early stories, the early church fathers and the seven ecumenical councils set out to create the one orthodox story of who Jesus was. Human and divine, without sin, begotten, incarnate, second person of the Trinity, co-equal, co-eternal, of one essence. And in the wake of telling the story of who he was, they then needed to tell the story of why this particular Jesus was needed. The story of our desperate human predicament, revealed fully only in the light of redemption, in the light of Jesus. We see our full predicament in his story. And only then are we both aware of that predicament and able to receive our salvation. As Blaise Pascal put it, the knowledge of God without that of humanity's misery causes pride. The knowledge of humanity's misery without that of God causes despair. Or as Yaroslav Pelikan says, Jesus was then not only the image of divinity, but the image of humanity as it had originally been intended to be and as through him it could now become. Or as Augustine said, the knowledge of the grace of Christ is unintelligible without the knowledge of original sin. But the knowledge of original sin is unbearable without the knowledge of the grace of Christ. Jesus was who he was because we needed him. But we didn't even realize we needed him until he came and revealed it. Orthodoxy. Orthodoxy. It is a profound story, this orthodox story. One that stretches back through time to the beginning of creation and all the way forward to the end of creation. Throughout time in the story of both Jews and Gentiles, in poetry and philosophy and narrative and art. A story that still resonates as we wrestle with sin and the need for grace. But that also turns deadly. When our definitions of sin are used by the powerful as weapons to judge worthiness by their own set of norms, rather than being used as comfort as we wrestle with suffering and trauma and shame and all the ways we subsequently damage ourselves and each other. The other story of Jesus that goes alongside this orthodox story is the story of the king of kings, which is our theme as we move through the centuries today. It is a story that is found throughout the hymnody of the church, but perhaps persistently in our beloved Advent and Christmas carols and our euphoric hymns of Easter. It somewhat clashes with the theology that we normally hear. As Messiah, son of David, the story of the kingship of Jesus is rooted in the Old Testament. In the question of both Herod the Great, where is the king of the Jews? And of Pontius Pilate, are you the king of the Jews? We see the story of kingship take root. The story of Daniel in the Old Testament envisions the destruction of four kingdoms before a thousand-year reign of peace 
such that the writer of Revelations could say, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Words immortalized by Handel's Messiah, such that you were probably singing it in your head as I said the word. Words and a story that had the original intent of proclaiming the lordship of Jesus and thus of God as opposed to the lordship of Caesar or any other human king. A radical, revolutionary, rallying cry to abandon Caesar's empire for an alternative kingdom to pledge our loyalty to something other than power and violence. But unfortunately, this metaphor, the story of Jesus as king, was turned on its head when Constantine converted, as he merged the metaphor of king with his own power and created the Holy Roman Empire, Christendom, in which the emperor was elected by Christ and crowned by God, to ensure the supremacy of the kingdom of God on earth. And so a new story was born, a story that has made Christianity incredibly successful and powerful. And in that far-reaching, all-pervasive success and power made Christianity at once benevolent and beautiful and violent and ruthless. Baptism class, six weeks with the kids. I have loved every minute of being with our children. We told the kids the story of our faith, a biblical story that shows God's steadfast love in the form of four covenants, showering Israel with guidance, protection, and forgiveness. And in the form of Jesus envisioned as this fifth covenant, a new covenant, unbreakable, unshakable, showering the whole of creation and every individual with grace. The story of the eighth day, the day of resurrection, the day of a new creation, the story of the Holy Spirit and the Trinity, and the tangible symbols of water and bread and wine, and offering us gifts of the Spirit, and fruits of the Spirit for our living. I have loved sharing our story with our kids. Last Sunday, the choir's cantata, which was stunning, told the story of Peter, a personal story of transformation with beautiful songs like Peter Wept a Bitter Tear, Chief of Sinners, and today's anthem, Living Lamb of God. As Becca and the choir were very well aware, it is a cantata that highlights the kingship of Jesus, giving us both the beautiful concept of loyalty to a higher power than empire, but also the concerning story of Christianity's devastating imperial and colonial rule. On Monday, Thursday, as Ray reminded us this morning, with the help of members of the congregation, including five of our youth who learned about it in baptism class, we told the story of the last week of Jesus' life. With attention to the often buried meanings of the story, the palms as symbols of a radical discipleship that takes a road less traveled. The upturned tables as a symbol of questioning oppression. Lighting candles for places of death, of violence and injustice and suffering. Breaking bread and sharing a cup and washing feet as symbols of humility and service and welcome. Prayer as a prophetic action for our own transformation and for the transformation of the world and the cross placed in the center of the labyrinth, symbolic of all the ways, all those whose lives have been cut short by empire, by those 
who have given up their lives rather than turn to violence to break systems of domination. And the woman on the hillside representative of the marginalized ones of the world who stand with the suffering ones to the bitter end when all others have fled. Today, we tell the story of resurrection. It is the story of resurrection that solidified the idea of Jesus as the Son of God, the Messiah, the turning point of history, the cosmic Christ, the true image, turning a crucified, radical, prophetic rabbi into the King of Kings. It is the story of resurrection that inspired early Christians and generations of Christians since then and Christians throughout the world to be inspired to tell the story of Jesus. The 20th century theology we have shared during Lent, Bonhoeffer, Process, Liberation, Feminist, Womanist, Black, Queer, and all the quests for the historical Jesus have been an attempt to wrest the story of Jesus out of the hands of the powerful and place it squarely back where it started, in the hands of the marginalized, the poor, the women, and the suffering in body, mind, and spirit. Our liturgical work here at Cairn, our seasonal group work, is an attempt to wrest the story of Jesus out of the hands of the powerful and out of the constraints of orthodoxy and place it squarely back where it began in the hands of ordinary believers in the multivalent voices of all of us who are wrestling with life and death, sin and faith, injustice and transformation. And our work as Christians is always to tell the story of resurrection, a story of overcoming evil, a story of laying down one's life for another and being vindicated, a story of being seen and known and loved and forgiven, a story of turning shame into dignity, burdens into blessings, Weakness into abundance, hatred into hope, darkness into light, oppression into freedom. It is a story that we are loved just as we are, we are worthy, and loved as we make our discoveries of who we might become. Transformed, resurrected, Reborn, able to tell the story of what makes our heart sing, and then together to tell a story of what we might do to make the heart of the world sing too. Amen. I invite us into our time of meditation. We are running a little long today. Um, our time of meditation with the Teze chant. If you would like to get up and light a candle, there are places at the back of the sanctuary. You can also view the artwork on our walls as you move around. But let us take this time either seated or moving uh, to reflect on the images of Jesus. Thank you.
as we prepare to come to our communion table, let us sing another of our images of Jesus in our hymns and our songs. Jesus gathered at a table during that time uh, that we call Holy Week before his death. He gathered with friends who had followed him, his disciples, and as he gathered with them to celebrate that Passover meal, a meal remembering forgiveness, he took some of their bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to them, saying, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, after the supper, he took a cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we gather at this table to remember this new covenant of love, to remember that Jesus lived his life for others, to remember all of God's covenantal promises to us, and to join our longings for peace and justice throughout the ages. Let us give thanks. Will you pray with me? Hear, O people of God, this is a moment, a moment of our human frailties and failures being recognized. May we stand here without shirking, shrinking, or wallowing. This day is a moment, a moment of faithful people ever reaching ever hoping for a path to redemptive living. May we know we are part of that ever reaching and ever hoping. This table is a moment, a moment of our frailties, failures, reaching and hoping, finding a story, a path that redeems and sustains us. May we accept it and share it. Indeed, our lives are a story a story of moment by moment by moment by moment. May we live, love, and resurrect this story. Amen. And let us sing together our hymn of preparation, Now the Green Blade Rises. And as we do this, we prepare our hearts and minds for communion as our children return to worship with us.
invited to come forward and receive the bread and the juice. Feel free to take the bread at any time as you are seated, and then we will take the cup together in community. Please come forward and let us keep this feast. The cup of love. And friends, hear the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, God's grace is revealed to heal our brokenness, to forgive our sins, and to set us free from all that would oppress us. And let God's people say, Amen. And let us stand now for the, the, thine is the glory, our closing hymn today. Let us stand in body or in spirit.
Thank you to all of our Zoom members. If everyone wants to wave to them, it's been great to have you here with us this morning. And let us all go from this time and this place blessed by God and blessed by this community of faith. Let us go into God's world to be a blessing and a sign of resurrection life. May God's peace be with each of you. And also with you. Amen. And before Amen. the postlude, are there instructions for the children? I do not see any.